Welcome to the King's Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, your King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. Joining me, Mr. Brendan Nunez, for a special Saturday edition of the podcast. Of course, Brendan is from the King's Herald and the King's Pulse Podcast. What's going on, Brendan? Not too much, James. I'm enjoying March Madness, and we got Elite Eight today. Sweet 16 just took place uh, two days the two days prior to us recording this and it's been fun it's been entertaining you know this is the like, closest I've paid attention to March Madness to be honest from the early rounds and it's been a fun time it's a it's been an awesome tournament like I, I just absolutely love watching St. Peter's like they just it's the deflections like they're they're undersized but they're they're playing hard they're all over the place guys are flying around Guys are getting to balls that you didn't expect them to get to. Um, they come up with big shots. It, like all of it, it it's been such uh, it's it's such a fun tournament because you have a great story in the Cinderella team. But in addition to the great story, it's like the best of the best. Like most of the top eight players in the draft are just sitting there fighting and playing. And so I think that's that's one of the biggest reasons why we're doing this podcast. Um, the secondary reason is because we recorded a podcast on Thursday, and I didn't like the final outcome. I tweeted this the other day. Uh, I didn't like the final outcome, and it wasn't anything that Brendan did or anything that I did. Um, it was that the nature of the conversation that we had was very sensitive, and I wasn't happy about the way that um, just the final product. Uh, I'll just put it that way. And uh, so we're going to talk about some of that stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about... Um, playoffs, Brennan, playoffs, oh, James. <laughs> we're going to talk about playoffs. Uh, no, uh, yes, we are. Uh, we're going to have a discussion because there's a reason why we're having a discussion. Um, and then we're going to delve really heavy into a lot of the, uh, the players that are playing right now and what we saw over the last couple of days. Um, uh, because I think there's some, there's some exciting things there are some things that make, I think both of us may have like, our opinions may have changed on specific players that we were high on and, or not high on. And maybe we are now and we, uh, maybe we aren't on someone. And so I think it, it adds to another layer to the discussion. And uh, uh, with that, uh, let's see, we'll cover the basics, um, go down and uh, subscribe to the King's Beat. Uh, give us a thumbs up. If you're listening somewhere else besides YouTube, give us a rating and review wherever you are. Uh, make sure to jump on board with the King's Beat. Uh, get yourself a premium subscription. Again, those are down in the descriptions. Um, but uh, we just held our fourth happy hour uh, off the record with the King's Beat Virtual Happy Hour Part 4, Infectious Disease Control. Brendan, let's start there. Like, What were your thoughts on uh, on the happy hour on, on Thursday night with Scott Moak? Yeah, I mean, they're always a good time, you know, like, I think I've been lucky enough to hear a lot of behind the scenes conversations throughout this season. And just like coming to realize how many stories there really are from so many different people, like, obviously, yourself is expected, but like, Scott Moak of sitting there courtside for years, and the stories that come with that, I just wouldn't have thought about that for some reason. And Scott's definitely one that uh, likes to tell stories and has a lot to share. So I thought it was fun. Yeah, it's fun, man. He is such a great conversationalist. And we covered all kinds of things like the NBA 2K thing, which like, I don't mind talking about. But the, the NBA 2K thing, Brennan, you asked him about that. Just like, was that crazy? It, it, it's crazy because he's announced an announcer on NBA 2K. And... Uh, he he has to call every game and every single player's name in a different way. Yeah, I asked him, I forget who it was. It was probably like an OKC game earlier this year where they had somebody on the starting lineup that I'm ashamed to say I probably didn't know very well. Um, and I think I had to ask Scott for an enunciation when we were in pregame. And I was like, you know, like, is that practice difficult or anything? And he's like, well, actually, I had to and he explained this on the happy hour too. Like you're saying with 2K, he has to go through and say every single player's name as if they're a member of the Kings um, because people, you know, will trade around in that. 
in 2K and all that say it as if they're a member of the opposing team. And then I think there was one other fluctuation that he had to do as well. And it's just like the fact that you're going through such a ridiculous amount of players' names in that entire process. He said like there's some small recording studio type thing that was even behind him for when he has to give them even more names. Like it was, that's ridiculous. They sent him out a, like a recording studio, like a, like sound boards and like a, an audio video board and microphones and everything else. And it's crazy. So what Brennan's saying is like, we'll just use this name for an example. Like if he's calling, Mike Bibby in the game, he's got to go, you know, you know, for the Kings, Mike Bibby. And then for like the medium is like Mike Bibby and then Mike Bibby. And so he's got to go through, uh, I mean, the league is like 450 players, but it's way bigger than that. Like there's, you know, there's you got a classic play. teams. On yes. There. He has to do all the G league teams that guys that might get called up. So we're talking about like probably a thousand plus names. And with all the 10 days and everything this year. Yeah, it's absolutely wild. And you wouldn't even think about that watching 2K that they do that. But I think that's the level of authenticity that we're seeing with video games now, where literally uh, every announcer in the NBA is doing this. They're calling every single name. They, they go to every single announcer. I'm going to sneeze. Yeah, it's something that until I was at a lot of the games and like got used to Scott's voice because I didn't grow up here, um, that it took me a while to even realize that it was like in the game with that, like you're saying, level of authenticity and just making you get the feeling of the arena fully. Yeah, it's super cool. It's super cool. And, you know, we've talked about this um, in other fashions. Like I was on D'Lo and Casey and, uh, and Casey was like, I-, I can't believe how big Mount Davis is in Oakland, right? And I'm like, well, first of all, like before Mount Davis was there, like if you went to an A's game, there's this beautiful backdrop of the Oakland Hills. That's what the outside the outfield wall looked like. And not only that, but they also reconfigured the outfield itself. So the outfield in Oakland used to be at, like perfectly uh like rounded. So if you sat in left field and a ball was hit to deep center, you could watch the guy race back and trying to get it, get his glove on it. Now, if you're sitting in left field, you're like probably six or seven feet higher than you were before. But there's also a staggered point where the ball disappears and you, and the man disappears and you don't know if it's caught. Well, like the cool thing about video games is like, you can go in and watch, uh, you can, you know, if you win stadiums and stuff on Madden, you can go get the original Oakland Coliseum and then you can pan around and see what it looked like before, which is absolutely amazing that what video game technology has done and how far we've come and all that stuff. Um, you've been yeah. researching with your kids, huh, James? Well, no, like I used <laughs> to play like Madden years ago, like 2004, 2005, 2006, like, but when you have kids, it becomes a lot harder to play video games and like just ignore your family and, and do that stuff. It does. Yeah. Yeah. You only can ignore them when March Madness is on. It's the only acceptable time. Well, but that's the thing. You can't ignore them on game nights and you can't ignore them during Mad- March Madness and then Sunday football. Me and my son sit and watch football all Sunday. Um, but, you know, some of the other family members get left out. Um, you can't do that. And on top of that, play video games and say, Hey, I'm going to check out for like three or four hours and hang out with my buddies online and play video games. There, there is some things that have to give at some point, Brendan. Yeah. Not for me. Not yet, James. Not, not yet. Not yet. (laughs) Don't go there. Not yet. Um, okay. So let's, um, the one other, uh, the, the huge topic of the week in Sacramento, um, we had the Indiana Pacers Sacramento Kings game, which was fun. Um, that got buried in the last podcast, uh, that, that will never be seen. I deleted it today. Uh, but Brendan, the, um, what were your, did you have a good time watching Ty and buddy? I mean, I had a good time watching Trey Lyles just have the highlight of the year. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Trey Lyles hammer. I thought it was fun. I thought, um, 
Right. It was Buddy ending the game in the most Buddy healed fashion possible. Started and the game same way. Yes. It it was genuinely hilarious how that game ended. It really is like I, I I've tweeted this before. Uh, you take the good, you take the bad, and in the end, you know you have Buddy healed. Um, which is a line, you know, it's the theme song from uh, The Facts of Life, which Brendan has no idea what The Facts of Life is, but anyone over the age of like 35 probably knows what The Facts of Life is. Uh, it was a TV show in the 80s. Um, but like you live by the buddy, you die by the buddy. Like he literally dribbled the ball off his foot in the first possession of the game. And it was like, oh, buddy. Yeah. What did you think of his accountability after the game? And his, uh, the Kings, you know, he just stood in the corner. Well, yeah, and what you're talking about is him saying that they viewed him as a, the Kings had him as a guy standing in the corner and that he gets to do more with Indiana. Um, he kind of took his opportunity to get some shots off. And, yeah, I mean, a stand in the corner guy is not what Buddy Heald is. I think, uh, yeah, we definitely did not see Buddy do that. There was, if anything, too often that Buddy Heald was initiating the offense at times. Um, so I, I just kind of chuckled at that one a little bit and was like, all right, Buddy just needs to get his shots out at the Kings organization, but didn't really feel any accuracy in that. Yeah, there was uh, like no accuracy at all. Like if Buddy Heald just stood in the corner, the Kings probably would have won like five more, six more games this year. If he just would have been like a stand in the corner, corner three guy, like, hey, man, just stand there. Um, don't do anything. Don't do anything else. Do less. Do yeah. less. No, do do more. Like, no, do less. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Tyrese, on the other hand, like, Tyrese looked really frustrated that he wasn't able to do more. But I, I think that he still impacted the game really well. He he got up there with his assist count and maybe if it wasn't scoring specifically, like I still thought he was moving the ball. All right. And it was pretty funny to see Davion go at him on one-on-one -on, -one, um, on isolation and Smoked that him. worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was like, I don't know about typical games for both of them. I think it was a, it was a good moment for people to move on because you saw, I think when you, um, when you're a Kings fan, you end up with uh, with purple colored lenses, right? You see everything. You see your players, and you want to pull for your players. Um, when you cover a team, you do get wrapped up in like watching a player develop and develop and develop. So I, it reminds me a little bit of this, like when you, uh, Brennan, eventually, if you have children, um, you know, you're watching them grow every single day, right? And you're like, the process is crazy. But then they go to like summer camp for a week. They come back and you're like, holy cow, you have this moment of realization that they are bigger and larger and their face looks different than they did before. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's one of those things where when you, you pull yourself away and you don't see Tyrese Halliburton play for a little while, you start to remember that number one, he like everyone else on the Sacramento Kings, has a major issue staying in front, in front of his man. I mean, Davion Mitchell just bullied him. Like, I, what did Davion finish with, 25 points? Um, yeah, he he was really good. And and that's not that Ty wasn't good, uh, but the, the Kings took away some of the things that Ty does well. You know, the, his shots that he, I think he was 4 or 14, finished with 11 points, 13 rebounds, something like that. 13 assists, yeah. 13, he's got 13 a, assists, my bad. Yeah, he's yeah. definitely got to diversify his like self-creation. He has that sidestep three and kind of like a pull-up mid-range, I guess, slash floater that he gets to. But mm -hmm. outside of that, it's there's definitely a need to kind of diversify where he's getting his shots that is still going to have to come with time. Like, I love Tyrese. I think I, I do still genuinely think he's multiple-time All-Star, not – a crazy amount of times or anything but two three times throughout his career like i still see that with tyrese but domas already is that guy you know to kind of come back to that conversation it is yeah i, I mean that's you did you you traded in like some some future years of ty for um for what sabonis is now 
Um, and, and again, I don't have any problems with the trade. I think it was good. I think it's good that they had that game. I'm bummed out Sabonis and Fox weren't there. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the the two key guys in that game, Chemezi Metu, who was incredible in the first half, and then Damian Jones. Like I, I, I'm so happy for Damian Jones because he's a good guy. He's a hard worker. He's been here, um, you know, two years now. Um, after signing a couple of ten days last year, and then and then this whole season, he just like there's something about a guy who puts in the work, shows up every day, doesn't know whether he's going to play or not, and most nights, well, a lot of nights this season, he wasn't going to play, and then when he does get his opportunity, he seems to take advantage about like I'd say eighty percent of the time. There's some games where he doesn't, but he gets a tip in at the with point two seconds left point. Yeah, 0.2 seconds on the clock, right? Um, which m- my guy, uh, I, I didn't write down. Um, uh, one of the one of the guys from um, from Portugal, uh, which I, I'm gonna f- see if I can find his name really fast because um, it, it cracked me up. Uh, he asked if we could play 0.02 of the podcast uh, or 0.2 of uh, seconds of the podcast. Um, and it was a clear jab at the Kings for not playing to me as Keita. Uh, but Keita did play uh, Ricardo Brito uh, Reyes. Um, yeah, he he's pissed, and, and everyone in Portugal is pissed because Nemias Keita gets in for 0.2 of a second in a game. Um, that was pretty crazy. That was pretty crazy. It was. I mean, like, we need to see Nemias throughout the end of this season. There's... There's no reason not to. Like, we're going to talk about this playoff there, race. There's no reason? Oh, God, James. Or is there? <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst part of the year every time. Like, I don't know. Namiash needs to get some run. You know, like, I, the same way that, like, I think I mean, Namiash will be, I mean, he's under contract next year. Like, same as Chomezi Metu is. D. Jones is not. But, like, all those guys feel like they have an opportunity to get some minutes and kind of prove what they're capable of. Like, I think Chemezi has been pretty clear, especially when we talk to him, that, like, he's trying to prove that, hey, I should be playing. Like, it seems like he definitely feels like he deserves the opportunity, and he has a handful of moments of capitalizing it that I understand. There's also, you know, a lot of quarters first quarters where he puts up eight shots and it's like why are you shooting at eight times they just happen to all go in in indiana Mm -hmm. so it's not like he's without his flaws like d jones is intriguing to me but also feels like a fairly replaceable prototype so i am like interested in these guys and i like that they're getting opportunities because it's gonna make for some interesting conversations about how to kind of round out the fringe of this roster come this offseason there we go. That's a good way to put it. Round out the fringe of the roster. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And then the other big news this week, um, we have the Rashawn Holmes situation. And uh, the Rashawn Holmes situation is super uncomfortable to talk to, talk about um, because we don't know enough information. And uh, part of the reason why the pod on Thursday hit the cutting room floor was uh, because of that discussion. Um, but I'm going to touch on it for a sec. And... Um, I'm going to say this, um, whatever happens here going forward, it, it will definitely, it, it has a potential to change our thoughts about Rashawn Holmes one way or another, right? So uh, there's a domestic violence claim in a, uh, a custody battle hearing um, where his ex-wife is, is saying that, uh, that he may have hit his son in the head. Um, we don't know the facts of the case. And uh, this is this is um, some of the issues I have. Uh, I- I'm just going to be like pretty, we're not media police, right? That's, that's not the way this job is. When you're media, you're not supposed to be media police. But um, I'm confused with what the Sacramento Bee did here in this situation. And uh, what they did is they took a, very substantial story about a Rashawn Holmes, uh, B Rashawn Holmes family, C the Sacramento Kings, and they wrapped up breaking news into an opinion piece. Now look, I have no problems if you write an opinion piece on this. I don't. 
Like if you wanted to write an opinion piece on this, that's fine. But in my opinion, you should have broke the news first. You should have had a, a, a news story that gave facts about the case um, that was not slanted one way or another. Because when you don't do that and you wrap it up into an opinion piece, then I start having questions about things like, number one, why didn't you quote the, the complaint? There's a complaint against Rashawn Holmes. Why did you not make it clear that this is a family court civil situation? And here's the problem. We can't get those documents. We can't get those documents because it's family court and there's children, minor children involved. So, so that leads us to having to believe somebody in their reporting who is writing an opinion piece and a slanted piece one way. And so I would like to have seen more. I tried to get the documents myself. Um, I have ties in the legal field, and I was not able to get the documents myself uh, because, again, it's family court. It in, in the piece, they call it private court. Um, but again, these things, those documents aren't floating around out there. So either they have the documents and they decided not to use the language in the document to actually quote what was uh, the actual complaint itself, or they took someone else's word for what the document said. And now that's a whole nother area uh, of, of why are you taking someone's word about something that could mean like, really you're, you're destroying someone's career, someone's family, someone, you know, you the damage that can be done by this is, is great. Now, look, if Rashawn Holmes did this, I have no, like, uh, just like it's the same thing with Darren Collison. When Darren Collison got arrested for uh, domestic violence against his wife, your relationship changes with him instantly. I did not write about him hardly at all after that moment. Um, I did not have nearly as many conversations with him. Um, it, it changes. It, the d dynamic changes dramatically because I don't believe in domestic violence at all. Um, I, I can't imagine ever hitting one of my children or, or my wife or anything else. That's just not who I am. Um, and I'm not going to support someone who does that. And just because I have problems with the way that this thing was written does not mean that I have problems with if he is found to have done this, then there's a huge issue. There's a huge issue for the Kings. There's a huge issue for, for Holmes and his contract. There, there's a lot of issues that come with this. But again, a couple of things I want to make sure I reiterate. There is not a criminal case against Rashawn Holmes at this point. Not a criminal case. This is a civil case in a custody battle. When Darren Collison had a was arrested, that's a criminal case. When he pled guilty to domestic violence and went and did classes and all this stuff, that was part of a criminal case. Um, and and in my opinion, uh, when you write something like this, there's a couple other issues I have. Um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a line I, I want to read that I wasn't comfortable with because it came right before another line. Um, I'm not convicting Rashawn Holmes ahead of his court date. Okay. First of all, a reporter can't convict somebody. Secondly, there is no conviction if there is no criminal case. So th those are issues that I have. And then when you come back with the next line, that I believe Alexis, which is the name of Rashawn Holmes' ex-wife, and then you go on and you talk about how you believe her and her story and you, that a, a mother wouldn't do this um, unless it, you know, like there are some things there that, that, you know, I disagree with because court cases happen all the time. Uh, custody battles happen all the time. And when custody battles happen, Sometimes there is things that are said that aren't true. And so we don't know. We don't know the facts of the case. And either she does know some more of the facts of the case or at least what someone, one side of the case, she does not put forth both sides of the case. Uh, a couple of things to, to finish up this. Um, number one, I did do 
uh, I have talked to people within the King's organization, and I will tell you that they know that Rashawn Holmes has been in a major custody battle with his son for the last two years. That there have been multiple times where Rashawn Holmes has come to them and said, hey, I need to step away for a sec. This isn't the first time we've seen this in Sacramento. Um, again, Trevor Ariza stepped away from the team a couple of times in the, you know, the five, four months he was in Sacramento before he was traded to Portland. He stepped aside multiple times to go to custody battle hearings uh, with with his children as well. Um, so Rashawn Holmes and the Kings, like they were on the same page about the custody battle. Everyone knows behind the scenes that there's been a custody battle. The Kings have told me, people within the walls have told me that they did not know that there was a new complaint, and part of that new complaint was uh, an assertion of domestic violence. They did not know that. Uh, so they have to do their due diligence, right? And there are some claims in, in the end of this that stick with me pretty hard. Uh, number one, that the Kings, the, the writer asserts that the Kings in the NBA have not suspended or done anything to Rashawn Holmes. And the first thing is, we live in America, there's due process, we have to let this thing play out before anyone should suspend somebody, because we don't know whether these allegations are true or not, right? So, and I'm just going to add in again, this is not a criminal case. Secondly, uh, the writer lists a group of players uh, around the league and says that the NBA doesn't do anything. The NBA doesn't do anything about domestic violence. Um, she mentions Lance Stevenson and accusations when he was 19 years old that he pushed his girlfriend down a set of stairs. She mentions Greg Oden, who I believe was, I, I think he was out of the league when he uh, got in trouble for, I, you know, again, domestic violence. Um, she brought up a couple other people. Um, Jackson Hayes which has 13 counts against him, I think still sitting out there. Um, oh, and Dante Cunningham. Okay. Uh, and, and use those as as examples of how the NBA has done nothing to like curb this issue of domestic violence. Um, she forgot about Terrence Davis, who is currently on the Kings roster, did not mention him at all which to me is very strange because he was in a similar situation a year and a half ago. Has the league done anything to Terrence Davis? Absolutely not. But the other like horrible, horrible thing that did happen in Sacramento was the Darren Collison situation. Um, and in that situation, Darren Collison pled guilty and the NBA hit Darren Collison with an eight game suspension to start the, the next season. This all happened. It, I, I believe it happened on Memorial day. Um, the year, his final year of his contract here in Sacramento, um, he sat out the first eight games of the season. So again, if you're going to make a straw man argument that the NBA and the Kings don't do anything, you probably should at least know what happened here in Sacramento and follow through on those things and talk about those things in your piece to balance it out. Because if not, you're you're doing a disservice. And I'm not trying to get the Kings off the hook here because, you know, they've made plenty of mistakes over the years with all kinds of different things. But at the same time, like, you can have an opinion. What you can't do is in your opinion piece, only use the negative stats that that sort of forward your point and not use some of the other stats that actually balance out the point. So do, does the NBA have a domestic violence um, issue? I don't know. Like I'd have to look at the numbers of the national rate of domestic violence versus the NBA's rate of domestic violence before I made any claim of that. Right. Um, but I do know that they have made a concerted effort to curb that and to make hold players accountable like Darren Collison. So um, again, this is an uncomfortable situation. Uh, I've told, uh, I already said it, but if there's a time where this is proven to be the case, 
then my opinion of Rashawn Holmes changes completely. And uh, and we're going to wait until that happens, though, because that's, to me, um, if you don't have all the facts uh, and you don't go to both sides and get all the facts, um, then, you know, I, I don't know what to say. Like, that's, to me, that's what journalism is. It's It's like double checking and triple checking. And in a case like this, quadruple and, and even more than that. And, and again, give me a quote from the actual, from the actual like statement, like give me a quote. So I know exactly what it is because if not, like it was ambiguous at best that, and you didn't even know if it was domestic violence against the former wife and the child or just the child. There was too much ambigu- uh, ambiguity in uh in the opening of that and uh i need more i need more facts uh and i know you're gonna hide that in an opinion piece but that's why an opinion piece shouldn't be how you break the news and uh to me that was stunning stunning by the sacramento Bee um that that made it through levels you know like i can tell you in the first paragraph or two where he's called sacramento kings forward um it, he doesn't play forward he he's a sacramento Kings center and I know that that seems like a like me like picking something apart, but it shows the the like right away the lack of understanding of of the player, the situation, the team, the fact that a team can't release information about a player with a personal issue. It is their personal issue, not the Sacramento Kings' personal issue. Those are things where um, I think there's just a a strange lack of attachment to like what actually happens like in these situations yeah i thought the information was definitely presented in a weird way like you just laid out like there's definitely a point right after like an ad break in there where you can feel the opinion piece really starting and i was yeah even reading it kind of confused of where this part was coming from felt like two different articles in a way um but on the situation in general like it's tough. It's something that I genuinely didn't realize uh, when I decided I want to be covering sports that was a conversation that comes up and I'd have to be talking about. And, you know, I'm not somebody that likes to assume things. I'm certainly not wanting to assume that she is lying. There's no way I, I'm trying to do that. I'm I also don't not yeah. trying to assume that she's telling the truth. Like, it goes both ways like and you're dramatically affecting people's lives in either direction um the wife the ex-wife Rashawn, the kid that's involved and in the middle of all of this it's just a really tricky situation and i I was shocked the way the news was presented but also just the news in the first place yeah the news itself is is alarming it's uncomfortable and you know again we dealt with it. Brandon wasn't here when we had to deal with this with, uh, with Darren Collison. And I'll tell you, I was, I was on a stadium tour in golden one before it opened. I was in a stadium tour when the news broke that, that Darren Collison was being arrested for domestic violence. And I had to like literally end the stadium tour and say like, look, we got, we got bad news here. I got to go hit this. And the PR guy that was with me was like, oh, no, like, because now he knew his day just got ruined as well. He had to go, you know, hit this thing hard and and go a different direction. Um, Yeah, definitely a a weird situation. And and again, I I have ties in Plasher County Sheriff's Office and the DA's office. I I was able to get information that other people were not able to get information. Um, And uh, and it wasn't a good situation. It wasn't so, um, but that's the difference is that one of them, one of the the cases was a criminal situation and the other is an, you know, an assertion in a custody hearing and, you know, we're a long ways away from, uh, from any of this being, you know, becoming a criminal case. At least that's what it, it appears at this point. Um, we also like, I've had to cover DUIs, like there are other things that happen in the league that you're like, okay, this is. This isn't fun. You know, I think this year in itself, we, uh, 
I chose because I, I didn't want to get into it. Like Tristan Thompson had all kinds of off the court stuff happening all the time. Um, it was always paternity stuff. And, but still like, I'm not chasing that stuff because that, you know, NBA players live a different life than most people in the world. They do. I mean, they, they have a very different lifestyle behind the scenes. Um, and I, I just don't have the brain power or the want to chase page views and I'm not going to. Um, that's not what we're about here on the King's Beat. We're about giving you, you know, really good high end content that's, you know, not aggregated, uh, you know, stuff that we're, we're literally like TMZ in this thing. We're not doing it. Um, okay. So we're going to move past this. Uh, and, and this will come back up again down the road. I, I guarantee it. We're going to have to address this situation again. Uh, but for right now, um, I, I think we're going to let the, the situation play out. And the best that it, uh, and and hope the best for everybody involved, um, and, and I think that's the only way we can handle it. Um, so we're gonna transition, and you know, again, it's not easy to transition out of any of this stuff. Um, but uh, there's this this weird thing that's happening, and and Brendan does not want to cover this, um, it, and it it is basketball related, and people are gonna like roll their eyes as soon as I as I say it. Oh, Do you even it. want to cover this, James? He he wants to roll his eyes, right? <laughs> he just he's rolling his eyes. I don't want to cover it because I think it's like it's hooey. Uh, but Brendan, Brendan, there's eight games left in the season for the Sacramento Kings, and of the eight games, I could make the argument that the Kings could win seven of them. I could even make the argument that you know. Maybe there's some way that they pick up an eighth and they finish eight no. If they finish eight no, they're in the play in. If they finish seven and one, they might be in the play in. If they finish six and two, that's a little tough, but there's still possibility they're in the play in. And I don't think anyone wants to hear that. Um, but no, nobody wants to hear that. They don't want to hear it. But no. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you there's a reason why I'm looking at this. So, Brennan, Kings play the Magic, the Heat, the Rockets, the Rockets, the Warriors, the Pelicans, the Clippers, the Suns. Eight teams. Um, of those teams, I think we expect that the Kings could could beat the Magic, the Rockets, the Rockets. Uh, it's a toss-up with the Pelicans, although the Pelicans have beat them up a couple of times. And then you're looking at the Heat, the Warriors, the Clippers, the Suns. Four and four does not get the Kings into the play-in because uh, the Los Angeles Lakers and the New Orleans Pelicans at this point both have 31 wins. The Kings have 26. Four wins gets you 230, right? It doesn't happen. But um, the Warriors are limping right now, uh, and whether they play players or not is going to be a major question mark. Um, the Pelicans is like a, that could be an epic battle. Uh, and then we get to the final two games of the season, the Clippers and the Suns. And if I'm the Clippers and I have a chance to help out the Sacramento Kings, so the Los Angeles Lakers, the team that I share a, an arena with and who has done nothing but steal all of the spotlight from our franchise for the last 40 something years, um, I might rest some of my players. If I get to the last game of the season, it's the Phoenix Suns, and I look at this honestly, and I say, I'm the number one seed, and the possibility of letting LeBron James and Anthony Davis into the playoffs somehow, if that's who would, if Anthony Davis will even play, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but like, if I have an opportunity to either potentially play the Lakers or the Kings, who would I choose? Maybe I'll sit half my players last game of the season and we'll let the cards fall where they may. Not play it out honestly. So all of a sudden I'm up to six wins. Then it becomes, can you beat the Heat? Can you beat the Warriors? Can You know, what happens? So the reason why this is at least any part of a conversation is because the, the, the Lakers have nine games left on their schedule. And their uh, record against is a 554 win percentage. And that's really good. They play, of the games that are remaining on their schedule, they have two teams that are non-playoff teams that are sub-500. Um, 
and those teams are the Pelicans, who are playing extremely well, who they play on Sunday. And uh, the other team is Oklahoma City, which they finish was second to the last game of the season. Outside of that, the Lakers play the Pelicans. The Mavs, who are fighting for playoff position. The Jazz, who are fighting for playoff, playoff position. The Pelicans again. The Nuggets, who are fighting for playoff position. The Suns, who, again, would probably prefer not to play the Lakers in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, the Golden State Warriors with three games left in the season, OKC, uh, and the uh, and then the Nuggets. They finish with the the Nuggets of that group. Um, if the Kings go, let's just say it's something silly, they go eight uh, and zero. That gets them to thirty four wins. The Lakers have to actually go four and five to finish the season, and uh, that's because the Kings and Lakers have. Uh, they've split their season series, but the Kings win like the, I think it's the third or fourth tiebreaker, which is division record. The Kings have uh, a um, five, five and, eight. and eight. Yeah. And the Lakers are what? Three and 11. Three and 11. <sighs> head to head, five and eight, three and 11. The Kings go seven and one. I'm not saying they're going seven and one. I'm just saying if they get to 33 wins. The Lakers, in order to beat them, have to win 34. So the Lakers have to go 3-6 and six in their final nine games. Again, I there are three games I could pick out that the Lakers could win. There are also, you know, some point where I look and go, I don't know that the Lakers can win three games out of those. So I don't want to get anyone's hopes up, um, but I think you're going to see what happens with the Kings on Saturday afternoon it was Saturday. If they beat the Orlando Magic, you're like, okay, that hurts your playoff chance, uh, your your uh, your draft chances, right? Um, and there's nothing you can do about your draft chances at this point because Portland is trying to lose every single game, and they probably will lose every single game the rest of the season. The Kings could try to lose every single game, but I, they just don't have a bunch of young players to throw out there and try to lose every single game. And the Kings play. Orlando, who's trying to lose every single game, and they're playing Houston twice, who's trying to lose every single game. So automatically you already know that that's not going to be easy, right? Um, so yeah. I, I think it's it's a better chance that because the Kings beat the Pacers that the Kings would actually probably, I'm just going to put a guess out there, they're probably going to finish with like the seventh worst record if they kind of just let go of the rope here. There's, there's almost no chance of you, um, like, holding off Portland. Portland's trying to lose too bad. Um, and, and so we're in this weird situation again. And as of right now, De'Aaron Fox and Demonis Sabonis, I'll tell you, they're probably not going to play the rest of the season. Um, I, I know that for a fact. But the reason why I would say they're probably not, because if the team rattled off, like, five or six wins in a row— they are going to play. There's a good chance that they're coming back and they're going to play. Um, so I think Sunday when the Lakers play the Pelicans, if somehow the Pelicans beat the Lakers in that game, I think it's going to become a bigger issue. I think it's going to be like, all right, maybe lay some up and let's see what happens. Uh, because after, if you get past Portland, I don't think the Kings can catch the Spurs. Um, as far as like, if you're going to go for it, they, they can certainly pass the Spurs, right. And they'll end up with like the ninth best chances of landing in the top four. Um, but I don't think that like they, they have a way that they can pull back. The Spurs are three games ahead of them. If the Kings know that they're going to catch the Spurs, then I think we would see them like let off if they don't have a chance for the plan. Yeah. You hate um, it. You hate it, don't I you? Do. I do hate it, James. I'm not going to lie. Um, I see. I understand. You know, like, it's the schedule that you're looking at. I mean, Orlando, yep. like you said, Houston twice. Golden State that is going to be injury riddled or might not have all too much motivation going into that one. And that's a second night of a back-to-back. For them, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, LA and Phoenix. Like, I, I understand the argument you laid out. But seven, even six wins without Fox or Domas. James, what's the longest win streak the Kings have been on this year? Do you know? They have 
one three game win streak. They won three games in a row one time, James. They've How gone many on times two game win two? streaks. How many times? Let's see. I think it's um, seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Their best basketball was like five and five back in November. Like, I just. Like, sure, you should be able to win those games, but you don't have Fox or Sabonis. Like, is Chemezi Metu going to be Clyde Drexler for a quarter in each one of these games again? Like, Well, I'm going to tell I you, just, like, De'Aaron oh. Fox is on the trip. He's on the trip, like, and his hand is all black and blue. That's what uh, we heard from Al- Alvin Gentry that, that Fox is. But, I, I mean, we know he's on the trip because him and Rissé, uh snap pictures in uh, the Magic Kingdom. They they were mm. at, at Disney World and uh, like I, I mean I know he's on the trip anyways because I mean he's been on the trip the whole time. Sabonis so on the other hand is not on the trip, um, but that doesn't mean that things can't change. Especially the way that this trip lays out, like Sabonis so was not going to play in these games and he and he won't play in the Heat. He would not have played in the Heat game just because out of precautionary reasons and healing up right. Uh, and then you get to the the Houston Rockets games, and everyone knows where the Rockets are kind of at as a team, and where they're at as a franchise. And they again, the bottom section, the there's a bunch of like 19, 20, 21 win 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 teams. None of those guys want to win anymore, so they're all fighting to like not win. Um, and you know, maybe Houston. I mean, they they at least play hard, but I could see them saying, "No, we can play hard, but we're not going to try to win this." And so. Uh, I don't know. I'm just. I, I'm saying. I'm not saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that if we didn't cover this, we didn't at least break it down. The fact that the Kings have, again, they have the tiebreaker against the Spurs. So in order, if the Kings say get to 33 wins, right, the Spurs have to go four and five to finish their season. Their yeah. schedule is tough too. Their schedule is. Um, Pelicans, Rockets, Grizzlies, Blazers, Blazers, uh, Nuggets, T-Wolves, Warriors, Mavs. So I, I got them with three like solid guaranteed wins, puts them at 32 wins. But in order to get past, you know, like again, so if they finish at 32, the Kings need to win six. They need to go six and two and they have the tiebreaker. So they would have to actually win an additional game between the group of players, uh, the group of teams. So anyway, I I, I understand why we have to do this because the Kings are going to go from the sixth lottery odds up to eighth and still not make the play in spot. Like I understand why we have to. It's just you, Brendan. It's miserable. James, it's miserable. (laughs) It is like right as I'm watching March madness, it's like, you know, the Kings really could win some of these games and these top prospects are just go somewhere else. And, I think that's the thing. Everyone's looking at, oh, my gosh, I, I would love to have this player on my team. And then you're like, oh, he's not going to make it because the Kings are going to blow this. They're going to blow it. They're going to blow it. They're going to win too many games. Well, that's – I mean, there's nothing you can do when you go up against uh, – I think the Indiana game we can just take and, like, put it to the side. And, by the way, they barely beat Indiana. That team sucks. <laughs> like, but, being real. But they, they barely – barely lost to the suns if they had won the suns game fair enough you you understand where we're at if they won the suns game now we're talking about they got to go like five and four to make the playoffs yeah five and four with orlando houston houston and even even new orleans on okay can you get one more win you could get one more win no problems yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's weird how this thing is playing out. Um, <laughs> and Davion Mitchell's got to be your best player throughout it, I guess. I guess, I guess. Uh, but which he's uh, done okay. No, he has done okay. I, I've been impressed with Davion. I, I like what he's doing right now. This is perfect. This is perfect. He's taking over the reins, and you know, we even talked about this a little bit. Like, um, I had kind of like foreshadowed that, like, when De'Aaron Fox goes down, Davion Mitchell steps into the starting lineup the debate over Dante DiVincenzo goes away because now you need Dante DiVincenzo as your backup point guard as well. So like you could start him at the two and you could stagger minutes and we can go through all that. Right. Or you can just hold him in reserve and let him play 32 minutes a night as your backup point guard slash shooting guard. And, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. And 
what did he have the other night? Eleven was it? Eleven points and yeah, eleven points, eight assists, eight assists and six boards, uh, six boards and a couple of steals, right? Um, no steals actually. Oh, no steals. Interesting. Um, how many turnovers? Two turnovers in his thirty-one minutes, and his shooting okay. was not great. Three of eleven Four. from the field, two of seven yeah. from three. But yeah, yeah. still, I mean, he does again. Like I, I feel like. How I worded it previously, like, fits well the more I watch of, like, his mistakes are really loud, but a lot of the good things he does are quieter, which makes him a confusing experience. <laughs> you know, like, the way you describe that, it's kind of a little bit of young Francisco Garcia. Francisco Garcia, every single game, would do something where he accidentally threw the ball, like, eight rows deep into the stands. And you're just like, oh, dear Lord. But the things he did well... Uh, it was an era where, you know, guys weren't shooting, you know, 12 three-pointers a night. So, you know, he would hit his threes for the most part. He was a solid three-point shooter. Uh, he would get a block, and you'd be like, huh, look at that. He'd get a steal. He'd make a couple of nice passes. Like, I think he clearly wasn't the, ath- the athlete that DiVincenzo is, um, but sort of that same type of player that it's a glue player that – you need that does a bunch of different things that actually help a team win. Um, so I like, I like DiVincenzo. I, we're going to have to figure, we're going to have a lot more discussions on what's going to happen with DiVincenzo um, over the next couple of weeks. But uh, let's get to our last topic, which is the fun topic. It is the, the, um, the, the biggest that the Kings are going to place themselves out of the ability to draft. Okay. So here's what we're <laughs> going to do this. We're going to do the business of basketball. Um, Brendan, the business of basketball question, um, Jaden Ivey, uh, Paolo Banquero, um, AJ Griffin, uh, Benedict Matherin. Should we call him Ben or Benedict? I like Benedict, but it always reminds me because I am a history guy. It reminds me of Benedict, uh, Arnold. Um, and then we have Chet Holmgren, uh, all, what are we, five of those players or in the sweet 16, um, Number one, shout out to St. Peter's, who is like the bomb. Like, Alvin the bomb, hyped them right? up, by the way. Yeah. Alvin was very clear that he likes that team. Understandably uh, so. Oh, oh, yeah. No, they play hard. They play really hard and they play together. Um, oh, and okay, so this is part of the business of basketball. Um, Brendan and I, as part of the. Um, wait, did you shave? I think I did shave before our last episode. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Brennan and oh. I, we now have a wager. If the Kings land the number one pick in the draft, the number one pick in the draft, um, James will uh, shave his goatee in a handlebar fashion, and uh, I will wear a Drew Timmy big, fat, white headband and do a podcast with uh, a handlebar mustache and uh, a big fat headband. Um, Brendan has uh, has has gone in on this. If the Kings get the second overall pick in the, with the second overall pick in the 2022 NBA draft, Brendan, what are you going to do? I'm going full of Doug Eddard. He's going full it's Doug. Time, yeah. I'll Nobody goes sure full Doug. The lottery um, that I'm in a position where I can be just a mustache and the hair's longer. We'll see it happen. I don't know why I, I keep getting at that I look like this guy. I don't. I'm so offended by the one tweet that somebody was like, "This guy looks like 85% of beat writers." And Aki decided that I was one of the 85%. And he, I see uh, it, but do we have to do that? Like, yeah. <laughs> He um why am I drawing a blank? He looks like Sam um like the the announcer said it the other night, but I've been saying it the whole time. Um uh, why am I drawing a blank now? Um tell uh movie actor. It, it'll come back to me. Uh, that's how my brain works. It, it eventually will come back to me. Um uh, anyway, uh so the business of basketball. Who is it of this five right now that to you either made you like them more or made you dislike them more over the last uh over the last two days because we just got to see the sweet 16 
which is spectacular. Oh, oh, and while we're there, I'm going to say this before you answer that question. Uh, medical update. James's leg is somehow doing miraculously better over the last uh, maybe like 12 hours, um, which is... And now I have I have gotten approval to go to the Final Four next weekend. Wow. So I will be on a plane to New Orleans. I'm still limping. I'm still, like, a mess. Uh, I'm still on blood thinners. Uh, and I'll have to wear, like, uh, like granny pantyhose, like, up my leg. Um, but I will be on a plane next, uh, next Friday morning going to the Final Four in New Orleans. Um, so anyway, uh, of these five players, Jaden Ivey, uh, Paolo Banquero, uh, A.J. Griffin, uh, Benedict Matherin and Chet Holmgren. Um, who changed your opinion the most one way or the other? It's probably Paulo. I mean, he's just been playing so well and that entire Duke team has what, like four prospects, um, that could potentially get drafted this year. So it, he definitely has a nice surrounding cast that he's working with, but I've been really impressed by his playmaking, like not just for himself and his kind of space creation ability but creating for his teammates like I think that I've been impressed and it's just been more than I expected the passing that we've seen from him I am really intrigued with him like I I would understand I mean I I think that Chet's actually going to be my lock for number one the more and more I, I go through this but I like could hear an argument for somebody thinking that Paulo is so talented that they want to take him one. Um, not for the Sacramento Kings, but I, I think that, that Paulo is that type of talent. If it all clicks for him, he's a guy with 6'10 and that sort of strength and agility that he has with an impressive handle where, again, he can create space for himself and also use his advantage to kind of set up some of his teammates that, like, I don't know. I've been I've been really impressed with Paulo because going into it, there was a lot of moments like I just can't help with him for some reason, but think that if this doesn't work, what are we looking at? And I'm really still not sure. There's a lot of times where I'm like, are you just able to do that because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? And a lot of guys that have those type of success for those reasons at early levels I think it's kind of hit or miss when they reach the NBA and you're not just physically dominant anymore like the amount of space that he creates I still have questions with but I don't know man these games where he's piecing it all together like you you can see the vision with Paulo so I think that that's been my biggest jump where he's probably going to be sitting in tier one for me but for the Kings I wouldn't take him one but I understand why he's viewed as that level of talent Okay, so I, I just, while you were talking, and, and I agree, just so everyone, I, I agree with a bunch of what he says. Um, Trevor Keels, Wendell Moore, uh, Mark Williams, of course, A.J. Griffin, and uh, Paolo Banquero are all considered uh, either first-round picks or first-round slash early second-round picks. Um, so that team is stacked, absolutely stacked. And, and I think the good thing, when you play on a team like that, it's cool because what you're seeing is a lot of times we see a player who like he looks so incredibly good when he's surrounded by a bunch of schlubs. Not I don't want to be mean to young you know like college level players, but you know guys who you know a bunch of seniors, a couple of guys who you know like at most guys you're watching in the NCAA tournament are the only guy who's going to continue playing basketball when they're their four year well when they leave like there's no one else on their team right there might be a couple of players here or there that actually go on to to make it somewhere but um i mean you think like purdue's interesting like they have their bigs that i think fit but when Jaden ivy's the one with the ball he pops so much more than anybody else well yeah but i mean like we basically have like caleb swan again and like uh jim McElvain. basically that's what those two guys are uh yeah yeah, and, and that's not a knock. I mean, Caleb Swanigan was an incredible, incredible college player at Purdue and looks exactly like uh, Williams for them, number 50. I mean, he's, it's like they cloned him there. Like, I, it, you know, I think they, they may have cloned him. They cloned Caleb Swanigan. Yeah. I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, <laughs> he, he looks identical as a player. Like, Caleb Swanigan had those passing skills and— 
uh, he's he's a big boy. He's a stud, but he's also he'll be lucky to go in the second round if he yeah. is. And, and so most of these players we're getting to see. So I, I think what's cool about Bancaro is we're seeing what he looks like with a three and D wing. We're seeing what he looks like with uh, with Mark Williams, who's considered a top fifteen pick, um, rim running big. You know, we're seeing him with uh, with more. We're seeing him with uh, you know, like players that are good, and that will there. There's a good chance they'll play in the NBA. Well, if you can still stand out and you can still do your thing when you're surrounded with a bunch of other NBA prospects, that's pretty substantial. You know, that, that it's actually, it's really substantial because if you're the only guy, then are we talking about a guy who's, you know, a good, good player on a bad team who's putting up stats on a bad team. And I I think a lot of these guys, we can't say that because their teams are actually good, but we're also looking at like elite athletes at the college level that can take their team. You know, they take them as far as they can take them, which I think is what we ran into Jaden Ivey. Like there's only a certain amount of like, Jaden Ivey could only take a team so far yeah and yeah I think there's kind of two ways with it where it's like yes it's substantial that Paulo pops alongside other NBA prospects I think the other side of it is that like because he has such a talented team he's just gonna go further in the tournament not that Paulo's not the leader of that team and the best guy but having a better surrounding cast is just gonna cause him to go further which you know helps your stock and just gives you more opportunities to shine in big moments so I think it goes a little bit both ways um but yeah there's definitely like an aspect of like Keegan Murray you know is he putting up those numbers because he's the number one guy when he shouldn't be or is it even more impressive that he's doing that with poor spacing around him and it's kind of like that's a line that you just got to watch closely and kind of teeter based on each prospect but what Paulo's doing is undeniably impressive and then like we mentioned Ivy I don't think that Ivy hurt his stock to me but to me jumping Paulo up kind of left Ivy in this weird spot where I don't know like I do I kind of have him next to AJ Griffin I think that I it's right around there, you know? Like, to me, the three is Chet, Jabari, and Paulo. And then Jaden Ivey kind of seems like the fourth on the outside. So it's less of, like, Ivy made me want to drop him down and more that Paulo jumped a tier and now Ivy's in this weird spot. Yeah, I definitely had uh, tier one. It was clear to me as Jabari and as Chet. Tier two... I think it became clear to me was Bancaro with the possibility that Ivy could jump into tier two. Tier three is now Ivy, uh, Matherin, and Griffin. And I don't know in what order. And there might be someone else who jumps into that tier as well. But right now, that's who my... Uh, like, so that's what where it was. Uh, I'll tell you now, it's more like two three-man tiers. And I, I don't think I'm going to... Like, for me, it really is like a 1A, 1A, 1B in Tier 1. So, like, I think Chet and Jabari are still slightly above Bancaro. But I I still could see why any team in the league would go, man, I I really like Bancaro. There's a couple of things about Bancaro. Um, He is a guy that, like I've said, I don't think he would fit. I can see more now that he might possibly fit. And so what I've done with Bancaro is, first of all, He's 6'10", 250. And then there's this weird thing where, um, have you read this thing where he loses seven pounds every game? He sweats out like seven pounds, which is absolutely crazy. And I, I want to know, like, is there a medical issue? Uh, which I, you know, I, teams will know coming into the draft that there's some sort of medical issue, especially when you're playing back-to-backs. If you really, at the NBA level, you can't have a player lose 14 pounds in two days. Um, that's That's no bueno. I mean, you're talking about, you know, like 6% of your body weight. That That's not good. That's not good at all. Uh, so he's going to have to figure that situation out. What What is, issue is it? And is there a way to avoid that, you know, with a professional training staff? Duke has a an incredible medical staff. They also are, they have a medical hospital on the campus. Um, so like do, players who go to Duke do have like a, a really high level of like there's oversight with them. We've, we've known that for a long time. Um, 
But what stuck out to me watching him is that he he starts to fit into a mold of player, right? And uh, and then when I look at him as a mold of of a player, and I start seeing other players, then I start thinking, okay, how would that player look with this player? How would okay? So to make a long story short, like I kind of circled three players that Bank Hero can look like at the NBA level, and uh, you can agree or disagree with me, Brendan. But those players are. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., uh, which I think Michael Porter Jr. is a better shooter. Um, they are Tobias Harris. Uh, and the third is Jason Tatum. Like I watched it. I saw a lot of Jason Tatum stuff, but more of like Jason Tatum still doesn't have the body that Paolo Banchero, uh, Bancaro has. He doesn't. Uh, like he's not 250, and I don't know that Jason Tatum will ever play a 250. Um, I haven't looked at Jason Tatum's weight, but I'll just tell you, like, like strength-wise, build-wise, Bancaro's built much. Uh, he has an NBA-ready body at 19 years old, where you know Tatum is still growing into an NBA-ready body. Yeah, I think I tried to come up with a couple comps as well because we were okay. texting back and forth about this. I kind of think um, a Julius Randle archetype makes some sense to me, where it's a you know a bigger initiator who is able to create space, but sometimes I'm a little questionable on the shot selection and he's not a great shooter. Um, Also made me think of like Detroit Blake Griffin and not saying exactly these caliber of players, but I think in the archetypes and the style of basketball that they play, like he doesn't have the bounciness. Detroit uh, Blake Griffin or Clippers Blake Griffin? No, I think early Detroit, like, Blake was really good on those teams. It's pretty much just he doesn't have the Clippers bounce, you know, but I I think that Griffin became a a pretty good passer and initiator for that team where, and and there's this kind of creativeness with that space creation and utilizing their strength that I kind of see with like a Griffin and, and Julius Randle. And both of those don't sound like great players, but I, I think that just when you're talking about the archetype, and like you see the stretches of Julius Randle being that guy, he's just kind of been inconsistent. So I, I think that it's interesting to me. I can see the, I can see how Paulo, De'Aaron, and Domas would all work together. I think it can work um, that you can have a good offense off that. And I think that when we're talking about that, we're kind of just talking about the offense, like the defense. I don't know if you would agree, but it's questionable between Domas and Paulo. Like you're talking yourself into offensive upside if you're taking Paulo, right? Yeah, my my problem with Paulo is is going to be two things. Number one, he's not a shot blocker. I, I don't think he's a horrible defender. I actually watched him move quite a bit, and I didn't think he was just trash. Um, but he's not a shot blocker, and I think the best the best thing to put alongside Sabonis is a shot blocker. Um, and he's also a high usage player. So at the college level, level, his usage is around 27. And I don't think that there's going to be an ability to add a usage player like that on the Kings roster. Fox is a little under 30 right now. Sabonis as a King is a little over 24. Um, you know, you, it, it just depends. Like, I think that the one thing that like Tyrese Halliburton was such an anomaly. He's a guy who averaged all those assists, but his usage is under 20. And Buddy Hill's usage is like 23, 24. So how do you balance that out? And so what I don't want is I don't want a ball stopper. Uh, but like I saw where Bancaro didn't have to be a ball stopper. And yeah. there were actually moments where he kind of looked like just a much bigger uh, Harrison Barnes. Where I'm like, okay, I get that. Um, but I also think that the Kings could use a guy that you that could be their third scorer. Or it could be a second score, and so the bonus would take like go from you know where he's roughly nineteen points, twenty points over the last couple of years, and drop down to more like eighteen. But you have some other guy who's scoring a bunch, um, and, and maybe Fox is an average in you know thirty points a game like what we're seeing over the last stretch, but more like twenty six, twenty seven. Um, you know those are types of things where you could see like another score could fit in and be really solid. So yeah. I like Bancaro, but then the same thing, like where I see that I know that Sabonis needs a shot blocker next to him. 
every time I watched Mark Williams, I thought, man, Paolo needs that guy. Like, that's the other thing. Like, Bancaro needs not what Sabonis is. He needs what he, a conventional rim runner. He, he needs Rashawn Holmes, you know? So I, I think it's just a different structure that you would have to look at. Like, you would really, a coach would really have to understand how to not just, like, foster, like, the right, like, chemistry and, and all the culture around the team about where everyone is sharing it and doing the right things for each other. Uh, but, you know, they would have to work really hard to make sure the Bancaro can hit the three at a much higher rate. They'd have to make sure the Bancaro crash the glass a little bit harder because he's not a great rebounder. He could be a solid rebounder. Um, those are some things. But he's a big kid. And, and again, when I look at sort of the other three, like you brought up three guys, I brought up three guys. Oh, well, you brought up two. Um, you know, Tobias Harris and Michael Porter Jr., so I centered on those guys a little bit because they play with uh, with really good passing bigs. So how do they look next to, um, you know, Embiid and, and Jokic? And I, I think the one difference between Embiid and Jokic and Sabonis is, um, you know, I think they're all really good at what they do, except for Sabonis is not the shot blocker that the other two are. And so you run into this issue that you still don't have a rim protector. Um, you can still play defense without a rim protector. You, you just have to have really good man on defenders. Um, but that's the one thing where I, I'm not convinced he's the right guy for the Kings. But I'll tell you this now, if the Kings landed, somehow landed the third pick, which we don't have a hairstyle that we would do for the third pick, um, maybe Brendan and I both have to do something wacky. Um, but if the Kings landed the third pick, I'd be much more comfortable with them taking Bancaro now than I was even a couple of days ago. Like I think he proved enough to me just the way he he moves in space, the you know his his body. Um, I want him to be more physical. He needs to average more free throws per game and stuff like that. But there's a lot there. Yeah, I think that if they buy the upside of Bancaro, which I absolutely see the case for, that. I would not mind that at pick three. Um, I, I think, again, that you can make all of them work like you laid out. Like you have to have a system that has a lot of drive and kick and everybody being comfortable with all doing that together. I think that so while you can make it fit and if you think that he's just the most supremely talented guy when you're picking on the board, I understand picking him for that reason. I think I run into an issue with like optimizing each of those guys where it's so many of their spots are on the same part of the floor, like getting to the rim or getting to kind of the elbow, elbow extended. Like that's where, I mean, your core is three guys that are all, every single one of them, you're being like, oh, we need you to kind of try to be a little bit better three-point shooter. Like I get it if, again, it's best player available. I see the argument because as much as they need floor spacers and they need X skill and Y skill to optimize Fox and Domas, what they need the most is another guy that's a third option, if not better. Yeah. And so I, I understand it. I think it would be a lot of work to, again, optimize any of those three um, when they're all playing alongside each other, but I would understand it. I mean, I would really move, look to shop it, to be honest, but that's a nuanced conversation that depends obviously what the what return deals would look like yeah okay did chet hurt himself i mean in his final game 23 minutes uh he scored 11 points grabbed 14 rebounds in just 23 minutes and had two blocks one of three from three he hasn't been shooting the three ball well in the tournament um i still like him a lot i still like natural fit i think he's still it's him and jabari next to uh next to sabonis and I even give Chet maybe even a little bit of a notch up because he's an elite shot blocker and elite, like both on the ball and as a weak side shot blocker, he's elite. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still in love with Chet. Like, I think that he is probably going to end up number one on my board uh, fairly comfortably. I'm not going to fully lock that in yet, but his skill set at the length that he has of seven foot with what is it a seven five seven five seven, wingspan seven five or seven six yeah which is just absolutely ridiculous and and what he's able to do put, putting the ball on the floor even if he's just like an elite 
second option as a ceiling like I, you can absolutely see that he's not one of the guys like like Paulo to me I'm like if he's not a number one what does this look like like could see it as a number two but I think it's more of a question like I, I just I love what Chet brings at his size and diverse skill set I'm not all too concerned about the weight um, I, I think that he's bound to put on a little bit of weight we'll see exactly how functional it gets but even like that Jalen Duran matchup that he had against Memphis like the clip that got pulled a lot was him kind of flopping and trying to sell a charge when Duran was posting him up but there's a clip not long before that he gets a block on a Duran post up like and if he's in a position where he gets to be a four and a weak side rim defender and like the way that Giannis is used I, I think that the defensive potential is ridiculous. I just like Chet is too much for me to overlook and like overthink. I agree. And then the other guy is Jabari. And and to be honest, I think Jabari fits really well next to um next to Sabonis as well. And, and you know, when I say Sabonis, I it's a pairing of Sabonis and Fox, but um I mean, we know it what the Kings need at this point. They need a floor spacing shop locking power forward um and, and that's it's complex there's uh, there's more of them in this draft than probably any draft i remember in the last like 10 years um but that's still something it's something they have to have right um and like i like jabari and i want to compare him to uh to jaron jackson jr because that's what I, every time i watch him play i keep thinking that and then, like, I, I look at his block numbers, and I'm like, ah, oh, his block numbers aren't great. But then he's playing with, like, the greatest shot blocker in the in the college game, and that's why he, he doesn't have a bl- bunch of blocks. Like, so I want to know more about what his block potential is. Can he be more of a 3 and D? Can he be a Jaron Jackson uh, who, you know, again, isn't a great rebounder? I think he can be a better rebounder than Jaron Um but what we're seeing from Jaron Jackson is, you know, a guy who's all of a sudden, I believe he's leading the league in blocks or really close to it. And and that's what the Kings need next to Sabonis. They need that guy that can, can get up and do other things. Yeah. And even if Jabari's not a shot blocker, which I, I think there's potential there, and I am totally with you that that's something that the Kings really could use and would make things a lot easier for them defensively with Domas assumedly being the five going forward. Even if Jabari's not that guy, like he's an elite three-point shooter, he's kind of where I see a little bit of Tatum. And and comps always have issues with them, but a 6'10 guy with a high release that shoots at that level, I think he's got work to do with his handle. Um, But, I mean, Jabari Smith is one where it's just like, this is such a high floor and a high ceiling in the most perfect fit for the Kings. Like it's uh, it's the easiest thing for me to talk myself into from the Kings' point of view. That's right. Um, no, I agree. Uh, let's see. Uh, of the other players, so um, I, I thought Jaden Ivey, uh, you know, they get they get beat by St. Peter's, which is just like a crazy anomaly. Um, he ends up with, uh, what do you know, with nine points, eight rebounds, two assists. He turned the ball over six times, one of three from three, from one of six from three, but his one three make was like in a crucial moment, which was huge. He still reminds me of the shooting guard version of Jaw. And I don't know how that works because you got to be able to shoot to be able to be a shooting guard uh, version of Jaw. Uh, but he's still like, he's still exciting to me. I would still take him. It, you know, I would, if I had the number four pick in this draft, I would prefer to trade that pick as opposed to drafting a guy like Jaden Ivey. But if you can't find a deal that makes sense, then he's a guy that I would really look hard on at just because he does have incredible potential. Yeah, I think it's another one of those. Like if you're just thinking that he's all star upside and you believe in that, then I sure I understand the pick. Um, I, I think that his offensive fit with De'Aaron is like fine to me. I, I well they. Both need to be a little bit better three-point shooters, which yeah. I don't think is asking all too much. And, like, Jaden Ivey is used to working off ball, as we've kind of seen. I mean, in that most recent game where they got knocked out, like, it was too often that Jaden Ivey didn't have the ball, um, which which made it a little bit of a tough evaluation for some of these games, to be honest. 
it seems like a kind of a complex stage with just watching Ivy and Purdue of, man, this guy should be getting the ball more often so we can really see what he can do. And yeah, so I mean, that's a guy, if they're sitting there at four, I absolutely can talk myself into the fit of Ivy for the sake of viewing him as the best available player. It's another one where I'm shopping it. Like it's nowhere near, like, like we've said, Chet and Jabari are the two to me where I'm like, these are phenomenal fits. If they're on the board, I'm taking that and just going with it. If Paulo and Jay Nivey are there, I'm really, really listening to conversations about what can we get if we move this pick and kind of gauging league wide interest in those prospects as well. But if the front office thinks that one of those two guys is just supremely talented that you can't pass up on and we're going to figure out the fit then sure because they're not horrible yeah um again i'm really intrigued by by a bunch of these players and and when we look at ivy with purdue number one they have like like a giant like a seven foot four dude who who clogs up everything so even what Jaden does like can't be optimized with him on the court right because teams are are squishing the lane and collapsing. They're all trying to, like, they're sending two guys to try to push the guy out. Like, that's what I saw all the time. And then the other big that they have, it's Williams, right? Yeah, um, Travion Williams. Yeah, Travion Williams, who who is, like, super impressive. He was super impressive all the way throughout the tournament. But I also noticed that they don't use Ivy as a cutter for him. So he's a really, really good passer. He also is a big load of a dude who gets way down deep in the post and like doesn't pass in certain situations but um again they're not able to optimize ivy using him um it was always him passing to like cutting wings and cutting bigs uh that led to his assists for the most part and so like uh, he's not a demon uh demonta sabonis type player because they used him too deep as opposed to pulling him out and using him more on the elbow which would which is what we've seen from sabonis um anyway uh like i I like ivy um and and then let's touch on the the last two uh between aj griffin and uh and ben matherin to me i like matherin better than i like griffin but one of them might be a better fit i I think matherin is more of like a a pure volume scorer and I, i think he can actually be really really good he's got a big time nba body um, Griffin is probably the better shooter. I think everyone fell in love with his, um, like his sidestep three. Yeah. It was gorgeous. It. it was a gorgeous three. Yeah. He had that step back at the, at the top of the three that was like, okay, I see this. Um, but you know, it's kind of too far and in between, like, I think my, what I've come to accept with Griffin and, in Matherin over the last couple of days of, and it's not just watching the tournament. Like we're diving into these guys just a lot deeper this time of year as well, yeah. obviously um, is man, you better be right with those because they are risky. Like defensively, those guys have so much work to do. I see it. Yeah. I see the potential. Like the, it's the classic, like, you know, they're good on ball defenders right now because they have physical tools and length and, and the strength to go with it. And that's when they're obviously engaged, but they're both falling asleep off ball all the time. Um, Waiting for a bus. That's what they call it. Matherin was bad with that. And they both, they both have a lot of moments of like, oh my God, that was horrible defensively. And, you know, like the guys I think of are uh, Jalen Brown or uh, Jimmy Butler, like I've heard, for example. And it's like, obviously I would be ecstatic with those archetypes but those are both like most improved candidate players jimmy won jalen had a year where he was very much so in the conversation where it's like guys that have all the physical tools but you need a big jump in skill set if they're going to be offensive beasts then they need to really improve their shot selection and their handle if they're going to be good two-way players, then sure, some of the things you're working with on offense like can just kind of clean up there, but then you have so much work to do on defense where it's like the mold of these guys fits really well with the Kings. Um, I, I guess I've heard some people say like, oh, it makes Davion's or Dante situation interesting. I'm not really considering them, to be honest, when I'm picking at like six or in the top 10. Like, yeah, just not. I'm with you. Um, 
So I, I really like their fits, the idea of them. I They just scare me. And can you wait for them? I, I totally agree. I, I think that's the biggest thing. Can you wait for them? And, and is the upside going to be there that you do wait? Because, like, when I watch Griffin play and he's playing with, we already talked about, we're playing with potentially five, he's one of potentially five first-round picks. I mean, it, there's also, you know, possibility that there's four of them in one second-round pick or, or that one guy doesn't come out or something like that. There's, there's all kinds of potential. But with Coach K leaving, I'm going to guess that most of those guys are on their way out the door. Um, so when I, I watch him, I worry at the NBA level, is there going to be a point where he can be more than a fourth option? And if he's, if he's a fourth option on offense – man, he better be good defensively. He, If I'm spending a top, you know, six pick, he better be really good defensively if I'm spending that much. I mean, he clearly has an elite skill. We all know he can shoot the ball. He's probably one of the best shooters in this draft. Um, he's a knockdown three-point shooter. So, again, the Kings need that, but they need a three-point shooter that can they can average 15 a game, really, or or more. They don't need a three-point shooter, say, like, just for example, like Justin Holiday, who shoots the three ball at like 38% on the season but averages 10 points a game because that's not the volume of threes that you have to take if you're that guy. And, and so he's going to need to be better at that and, and take more shots and, and be some sort of impact player without being an on-the-ball guy or a guy with the ball in his hands. So they need a Keegan Murray. Uh, well, I maybe. have been. I'm I'm kind of joking there, but the, I've kind of come back around to this. In my whole, Griffin and Matherin are are really raw guys. Of like, there's so many moments that pop off on both ends of the floor, and defensively they're negative. That when I was watching Keegan, I didn't have those positive pop moments on defense as often as maybe as I expected because of like the hype going into watching it. Yeah, but I also didn't have the negative moments in the same way. No, I'm with you. I, I think, but if you're drafting in the top six, it's always going to be about upside. It's always going to be about ceiling, and it's it, you know it's not going to be about floor. It's always going to be about ceiling. Um, you know, every once in a while, you're like, okay, this guy's ceiling is extremely high, but his floor is so low that he could just become, you know, complete bust, like uh, a thon maker, thon maker, right? <laughs> Yeah. So something like that. Um, but at the same time, like I, I definitely see that there are ways that, uh, you know, that the the Kings could talk themselves into something. But I also look like if they're going to win a couple of games here, um, they're going to have like the opportunity for one through four. And then they're probably blanking themselves out of number five, number six, and potentially even number seven. And so you might have to be looking at a Keegan Murray because you might be sitting at number eight, number nine. Um, and to me, if if you're taking, like, again, if you're taking Keegan Murray at number 12, then I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Because I don't think at number 12, a number 12 pick isn't a, a game changer, uh, typically. I mean, Tyrese Halliburton clearly was, was a game changer. Um, but if you're taking Keegan Murray too high and you're ignoring the potential of other players, which you know, couldn't far exceed his potential, uh, then, then I think, you know, you got to be cautious. Yeah, I definitely get it. I think it's going to come down to how good I feel about these other guys because initial impression compared to the last two years is that uh, there's not the depth in this class in the first round of, you know, there was a lot of guys I think I could get, you know, 20 deep in these last two classes of guys that I really liked and I think that number falls off pretty quickly in this one. I say as I still need to do a lot more research on some of a little later into the draft, but it just doesn't feel like, you know, what typically would be a 10th pick could be just higher in this draft. Well, I mean, look, the the example, let's look at De'Aaron Fox's draft. Um, you know, we're talking about... Uh, you know, a, a really, really what was considered an incredibly high end top end, right? The the top, even the top four, uh, where Fox kind of moved up and got himself into that conversation to become the fifth pick. 
Um, but we came into that with uh, Mark Fultz, uh, Lonzo Ball, uh, Jason Tatum, and Josh Jackson. Josh Jackson is the one who's totally busted. I'd say that Lonzo, well, and Markel has come close to bust. Uh, you know, there's still like some question as to what he will become. Lonzo hasn't worked out to be nearly as good as what you thought, you know, he could be. Um, and then after them, there's a whole bunch of guys who like fall into this, like, yeah, you know, I, I have it here. Jonathan Isaac, Isaac. Laurie Markinen. Yeah. Who's We're better than... fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then Frank Nielakina. Dennis Smith, Dennis Jr., Smith Jr., now Zach Collins. Zach Collins. Now, my point is, we looked at that draft and we looked at the top end like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. After you get past Zach Collins. Malik Monk, <sighs> Luke Kennard, Donovan Mitchell, Bam then, then it starts to heat up. Yeah, and then Justin Jackson. Who's number 19? Uh, John Collins. John Collins is number 19. Number Jared 20. Allen, 22. Number 20 is uh, Harry Giles. Of course he is. 21, uh, Terrence Ferguson. Yeah. 22, Jared Allen. 23, OG Ananobi. 27, Kyle Kuzma. Josh Hart and Derek White are at the end of the first round. Okay, so in that draft, we're talking 17 rotational players in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Maybe 15 plus starters. That's a hell of a draft. And so I don't know that this draft is going to be that. I don't know it's going to be that. So that was my point. Like it, when you look at a draft, like we're going to go through this draft a bunch. And even like, uh, you know, like Mark Williams is considered like a top 15 pick, the the Duke center. Um, we're going to see, it, it, who is he? Like, who does he amount to and stuff like that? We'll, we'll get much deeper into the draft as we go along. Um, we're going to bring in some really, really good guests and all that stuff to fill out um sort of the how we're we're managing the draft uh talk going forward uh, we got to get through the last couple of weeks here of the regular season uh we also you know next week is going to be a little funky because i am going to the final four but i should still be able to do tuesday thursday pods uh it's just everything else might be a little funky and then um i'm going to add this to since we're wrapping up here um i i'm gonna do uh because we have a game on saturday night and it's been a light week for games. Um, I'm going to push everything back. We're doing the podcast today, uh, which is unusual. It's usually on Thursday, but we had some some issues there that we've already discussed. Um, so we're going to push back the weekend review to Sunday, and then we'll do Monday musings um, because I think that works better this week. And uh, and then we'll get right back into podcasting on Tuesday and uh, and Thursday, and then we'll we'll figure out next weekend when when it gets here. Um, Brandon, do you have any final thoughts? We've covered a ton of stuff on this pod. I just can't believe that you talked about the Kings going seven and one. Book it. God. Don't don't I, book it. Don't, think, don't bet that. I hate that I'm like they could. No, nope, that's the problem. <laughs> like we can't ignore it. Like I want to ignore it. I, I don't think I mean just being like like honest, like there's there's still a chance that's cringeworthy yeah who knows so that, we might see terrence davis again this season <laughs> no uh, no 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 I don't, I don't think we're seeing terrence no at this no. point we never know no yeah i i think uh like we're seeing <laughs> we'll know a lot more like if they lose in if if they uh if the lakers win on sunday and uh and beat the pelicans um then I, I think it changes the dynamic of everything, especially going into the Heat game. Like, and if the Kings lose that game, the Kings' magic number drops to like, well, their tragic number I think drops to one. So it's and all but over at that point. Even if like I'm honestly not ruling out that they lose to Orlando, like, you know, that one thing happening, it's like I guess we oh, can still yeah. be like, oh, maybe, Play taps. but yeah, no, it's over. Yeah, yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been an adventure today. Um, you know, some good, some good stuff, some good topics of discussion. Um, you know, hope that everything uh, works out the way it should work out with uh, the Rashawn Holmes situation. We'll be tracking it. We'll keep you up to date uh, when there's more news that uh, is meaningful and that makes sense for us to share. Um, the draft coverage is only going to intensify. 
Um, by Tuesday, we're going to tell you that the Kings are making the playoffs, uh, not just a play in. They'll they'll have skipped ahead like somehow and picked up eight wins somewhere between there. And we'll um, let you know what point guard they'll pick at nine. Yeah, it, it's science. Yeah, what point guard they'll pick at nine. There you go. Um, or center because, you know, they still don't have enough of those. Um, we're going to pull for uh, if something, like, again, we'll get to this point where they are eliminated. And at that point, if they're not playing to me as Keda, uh, I got you, Portugal. <laughs> I'll be all over Alvin Gentry about why Keda is not playing. Um, but I look at the numbers, and that's why I'm like, okay, do they still think they got a shot? And I think they still think they have a shot. So until they don't, they do, and we'll have to play it that way. Uh, yeah. yeah. Harrison Barnes is going to show up again, and we're going to have a lot of faith. Kaka. Yeah. Oh, oh. And we'll finish with it. Um, Scott Moak, like, informed us that he has – the caca button like scott they have they have like over the years he gets more and more buttons to press so he has different noises that go on but that discussion was was that not like one of the most interesting things where the thing you don't think about how there's literally like five songs that play on every single break and, and how so if there's going to be like 30 breaks in a game that they have to have like hundreds of songs teed up yeah or he talked about filling the time of what was it at least 20 minutes on, oh with barf uh, guy yeah with puke man puke man yeah yeah, yeah it's definitely interesting, interesting. he was the uh what's the one that westbrook got in his feelings about earlier cold as ice we had the bing bong player, the ice year, cold. player of the game before that yep yep yeah he yeah was doing all it, that it all of it's interesting all of it's interesting all right, well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kings Beat Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's a set, special Saturday edition. Uh, hopefully this helps get you through your, your weekend. And if nothing else, uh, you can listen to us on Monday morning um, and think, why are they talking about this when the Kings lost to the Orlando Magic? Um, whether that happens or not, we'll see. Uh, so for Brendan Nunes from the king's pulse podcast and the king's herald i am james ham your king's insider for espn 1320 and the king's beat thanks for tuning in we'll see you on tuesday